Welcome to Boil the Frog Slowly, a radio program that goes where corporate media stops, where each week we ask the questions, are politics hazardous to your health? Are the decisions and incremental changes being made by government and industry creating health problems? What are they? Why don't you know about them? What can you do about it? Not only do we ask the questions, we furnish answers with unparalleled documentation, research, studies, and guests from around the globe with proof that unequivocally show that yes, politics are hazardous to your health and you had better be informed before it's too late. Boil the frog slowly. A cute name? No. It's what's happening right now to you and me and the rest of the world as we placidly float in a slowly simmering pot of subtle changes and those who hold the recipe to this agenda count on the fact that we won't notice the heat until we're sufficiently boiled unable to resist i'm pat and i'm sebastian and today we're stirring the pot thanks for joining us Well, Sebastian, another great week, right? Absolutely. All right, we've got a returning guest. It's Elizabeth Kelly. We call her Libby. She is the founder of the Electromagnetic Safety Alliance. And last we spoke, we discussed Wi-Fi, wireless in our national park system. And we decided it's such an important topic that we wanted to have her back again. And let's delve a little deeper and uh, see what else we can find out about this horrendous situation. So welcome to the show, Libby. Well, thank you, Pat, and Happy New Year. And Happy New Year to you. Let's hope it is, right? <laughs> That's right. Absolutely. All right. Well, we were wondering, I know we only had 50-some minutes to speak last time, and there's got to be more information that you know that we need to know about what's going on with the Wi-Fi in the National Park situation. So can you fill us in a little bit more? Are there any new developments we need to be aware of? But people really need to know that they need to get on board with this because it's going to spread through all of our national parks in the United States. The National Park Service has been well aware of the issue with uh, uh, these antennas since the very beginning. I was consulting with the Park Service. In fact, I met with the Park Service Director in Washington, D.C. about this, as I said on the last show, to bring to his attention the effect on the birds. Well, there's so much more knowledge than there was then, which was 10 years ago. And PEER, the uh, Public Employees uh, Environmental Protection Group, has a petition on their website. It's www.peer, um, peer, P-E-R, that's right, dot org. This is a group based in Washington, and it's composed of former state and federal employees who are concerned about the uh, uh, wireless invasion of our national parks if you go to their website and and put in cell towers, they have a whole page on this, um, and that's where you should go to sign and then forward that forward that petition because they have a com- campaign going on and they need your help. Um, I'm not sure. I can't, I can't recall, Pat, how far we got last week when we were last time when we were talking about the information that was coming out about the uh, the wildlife. No, actually, it, we got a little sidetracked. There's so much to talk about on this issue that uh, we didn't really get much into the wildlife or parks at all. So let's let's delve into that today. Okay, because you know there's quite a body of science about this that is has been available uh, for well, probably decades. But in the United States, more recently, over the 20 years uh, that I know of, there has been ongoing research. For example. The uh, the problems with uh, uh, broadcast towers, radio and television towers, uh, preceded the problems that are now occurring with cell towers and other wireless exposures. There's a group of uh, ornithologists at Cornell University who are looking at this, and another group uh, that has their own website. As if I can recall the name of the website, I'll mention it in a little bit, but uh, birdkill.org, I think it is, they are uh, researching around the basis of these broadcast towers and finding many dead birds. These birds get thrown off course by the lights, uh, particularly the white lights at night, which are not allowed, but they happen anyway. And These towers are very tall because they're for radio and TV broadcasts. Um, 
Uh, and so birds are attracted to the light, and then they lose their way, and they, they're migrate, migra- uh, magnet, magnetic in their brain, which determines migration for them to where, where to go, gets, gets out of kilter, and they eventually become exhausted and die. So they've been freezing these birds by species and counting them up, and they're very concerned about the future. And there's a man named Dr. Manning with Fish and Wildlife, federal government, in the Boston region, and he too has been researching this for a long time. So there's a body of evidence that shows the effects on the birds and on on nocturnal animals, because nocturnal animals respond to light just like people do. And light can throw off the circadian rhythm of all living species that respond to light. And then uh, that could lead to a damaged immune system and down the road to disease. Uh, that is a theoretical because it hasn't been shown with all species, but it's known to exist. In fact, some of the strongest evidence about that came out about 20 years ago when they found that uh, night shift workers, people who uh, were up all night and slept during the day, were more apt to get cancer, breast cancer, because their habits were putting them in the, in the light, artificial light, at a time when they should be producing more serotonin for the day. Uh, so, you know, you produce serotonin for the day and melatonin for the night so you can go to sleep. And it throws that hormonal cycle off. So this is not just a theoretical. It has been shown. And so uh, I happen to live in a dark sky city, Arizona, Tucson, Arizona, and we have very low lights in our community that are only 5% of what's allowable. And we, one of the reasons why we do that is for the nocturnal animals. So there's so much involved, and if the parks get flooded with this artificial light, invisible light, it will affect all the life life that's in that park, and that is going to be quite damaging. You know, it's interesting, Libby, folks tend to be more concerned about endangered species when it comes to animals versus when it comes to human beings. Hopefully we can tackle this using that thought process. Okay, maybe in the parks, what endangered species might be contained within these within these parks? And I think we might be able to get like a group of people that would seriously be concerned about that, even if we can't prove that this is definitely a health hazard, but that might be, just might be the route to go to create some more awareness. That's a good idea. And if I were going to do that, I'd tell you what I'd do. I'd get in touch with the uh, director of PEER, P-E-E-R. He's very approachable. I called him myself. You can get his phone number off their website and share the idea with him because he is representing a lot of people who are whistleblowers who, whose jobs are on the, la- on the line if they are behaving in a way that is going against uh, the policies of uh, where they work. And so they can get in a heap of trouble. So volunteers could do this and work surreptitiously with active federal employees who are concerned but can't do anything to identify a species or two and then study them and see whether they're being affected. Well, I I know there's been a lot more work on this in Europe uh, than there has been in the United States, Um, but I would think that these people would have a lot of ground to stand on with that recent letter from the Department of the Interior that was just uh, written this year to the FCC. I mean, that was... Just an incredible letter. There were no punches pulled, and and he, uh, the director, even cited uh, a lot of uh, European research that had been done on on birds and uh, cell towers. Well, you're right. I'm I'm pulling the letter up on my computer right now so I can speak to it. This is amazing. In the in my experience working on this issue now 20 years, we have not come across one federal agency taking on another when it comes to electromagnetic fields. The, as you may know, the FCC is the uh, primary pers- uh, organization representing the federal government regarding commercial exposure to, I mean, human exposure to commercial sources of licensed spectrum that they manage, and that would be cell towers. They don't regulate smart meters or local Wi-Fi systems because it, they determine that they are not powerful enough to be licensed. There is a big issue behind that, too, but I won't go into it right now. But they do license uh, and increasingly are regulating uh, cell towers and federally regulated cell towers under a new regulation that have more than one carrier on them. Um, 
but they're supposed to work closely with our federal health agencies, which they have not done. And we have challenged this. I was part of a lawsuit policy uh, appeal, rather, challenging this in the, sec in the U.S. Court of Appeals in, starting in 1997, that you did not pay attention to the advice of the federal public health agencies. So the FCC has uh, uh, continuously adopted a safety threshold hold, which is only protecting against thermal effects or burn or someone going into shock because of uh, the high exposure, heat, heat-based standards. The, there is a low intensity level of exposure, very low threshold, uh, and there's a lot of studies that show at that level without heat, there are biological changes that take place, which some are reversible and others are not. And now we have with chronic exposure, all of life being exposed constantly to radio frequency exposure, even though the, the guidelines themselves only talk about short-term exposure, a half an hour for people, six minutes at a time for workers in this country. But no, we are with living with this technology now, light, night and day, voluntarily with cell phones and Wi-Fi in the home. And then everywhere we go, there are Wi-Fi hotspots and cell towers and, and so forth, So and smart meters. So it's it's so out of bounds with those guidelines, and something needs to be done about it. Yes, I think the birds are the best called because that's where it seems to wake people up and take action. Uh, when it comes to people, I hear a lot of denial. I really do. Well, I need it. I need my phone and so forth. Um, and there's so many great apps. But uh, I'm just hoping that this letter results in action. Yes, and I, the letter actually went beyond just birds. I think he even uh, talked about how it affects um, all uh, plant life, trees, uh, insects even. And he cited uh, worldwide research and even uh, anecdotal evidence. In fact, I think he acknowledged that there are mountains of anecdotal evidence. So obviously there are a lot of people out there that are noticing these things happening and calling in to tell about it. Well, there, there's a lot of science published on this. It's just not been brought together into one piece. And then again is, who would look at that body of science? Uh, the United States government, the FCC, is only talking about exposure protection for people. It doesn't even mention nature. Uh, I'm sure that that is how all the other standards are contrived in the world. The international standards recommended by the World Health Organization are only geared towards protecting people. So are the... Uh, stand, uh, that's the International Commission for Non-Ionizing Radi Prote Radiation Protection. The IEEE standards issued by the International Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineers is also geared only towards people. But uh, animals have a very different uh, tolerance level and their safety level of what they can tolerate is, I estimate, to be much lower, especially tiny insects and birds and bees. And they are calling for help. If you know the study by Philip Barre, a Swiss scientist, he discovered uh, that when bees are exposed by a cell phone or a cell tower placed in their hive, they start a piping sound, which is inaudible to the human ear. It's a very tiny, high-pitched sound. And it is a stress response. Mm -hmm. And that may explain why bees evacuate hives. Yeah. Even I'm, if the mother is there, the queen bee, they, they still will, they have to leave. It's too stressful. I'm so glad you cited that study because uh, I was just reading a report by Barry Trower last night, and, and he, he, he did a cite that there was one peer-reviewed study available on, on bees and correlating to the, the worldwide bee uh, die-offs, the colony collapse, as they call it. And the study clearly showed that the radio frequencies, uh, it disoriented them, and they could not find their way back to the hive. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And now we have the cry for help, uh, which is on tape. I haven't heard it yet, but uh, I would love to hear what that sound sounds like. But I'm sh it's horrific to think of what we're doing to our wildlife because <laughs> we're killing the species. And as, as has been said a lot lately, if, if we, we are killing so many species on the planet that at some point there becomes a tipping point because it, we are reliant upon the birds for, for pollination. We're reliant on all these animals to, to uh, live in our world with us. And if they disappear, that's a bad sign for what's coming for us. Have you heard about the, 
The traveling bees, they put bees uh, in major trucks and they ship them around because there aren't enough. For example, they ship them to California, I know. Oh, wow. Uh, and they, they rent them out, and so they install them, and then they pollinate, and then they pack them up and move them somewhere else. These bees are not in good health. Oh, no. They couldn't be being shipped around like that. No, but they're, they're, they're brought in to fill the gap, you know. Oh. It's just, just put a Band-Aid on it, and it'll yeah. be fine. Yeah, without any explanation for why it is they need to be doing this. It's just they have to fill a gap. You know. Wow, and then not only not only that, you um, I also read you know, actual studies that show uh, on raw data that the uh, communications industry uh, is the highest contributor to carbon emissions on the planet. So uh, you could even blame uh, carbon emissions on that. And interestingly, the the, the most um, important aspect of that uh, that affects us all is the. Um, when rain mixes with the carbon in the atmosphere, it creates carbolic acid. And then when that comes down into the oceans, it increases the acidity of the ocean. And I think half of the world's photosynthesis takes place in the oceans, you know, that creates the world's oxygen. So uh, when you're looking at cell towers, uh, the industry in general, the telecom industry being the highest carbon producer, it boils right down to how much air we're producing on the planet. Yet it, it seems like all of the uh, powers that be that push uh, the green uh, uh, efforts, you know, they want to blame it on everything else like power plants and automobiles and industry. And they're not even looking at the telecom industry when they really are the number one producer. I, I mean, it's just incredible. It is amazing. It's like a silent partner in everything. And yet... Uh, there's no evaluation of it. Like, could it be a uh, part of global warming? Could it be causing heating of the planet? When you consider we're microwaving the planet, mm -hmm. and our air quality has basically become electrically charged, and this is only going to get worse. Yeah. And why then you combine... aren't people looking into this? And it's not as though there aren't people pointing this out. I'm not making it up. I've been hearing it from many sources. Why aren't we looking into this? I mean, even to dispel it, there's there's no interest. These people, unfortunately, who are the purveyors of this technology, are just not curious. Yeah, they don't have a need to understand and to support why they're doing what they're doing. Because why? Because they write the laws. They uh, provide the large campaign contributions to keep officials in office who will do their will. This is not a democracy. No. No, and, and that you put that a good way. I think that the best way to put that would be their interest is to keep the people from becoming curious. And to do that, you need to keep warnings off packaging. You need to keep it off the media and, and just keep everybody from, from being curious at all that there could be any issue with this technology. Yeah, I know. And anybody that brings it up is kind of considered crazy. Yeah. We, we just went through... A terrible. Oh, I, I'm not. We're not done talking about the NOI letter, um, the DOI letter. By the way, the letter uh, is is going all over the place because it's it's really legendary, uh, and as you indicated, it's very well supported with scientific data. So anybody that wants to delve into that letter can can get a lot of information about the science, and then raise it with the FCC. Like, what is your response to this letter? You know. People can write letters and send emails or call the FCC and ask about the status of this letter because we need to keep that issue on the table. Yeah, and the letter is written by uh, Director Willie R. Nye, N-Y-E. And he's a hero in my opinion. I mean, like you said, it's the first federal level acknowledgement that there's any problems at all with the radiation coming from cell towers. First time. It, I mean, it's momentous. It's it's just a, an incredibly uh, important uh, point in history here that this letter represents. I, yeah, we need to talk about this. People need to take notice, and and that's a good recommendation, Libby. Call the FCC and ask them what they're doing about it. That is a gr right. great idea. Yeah, keep keep talking about it. Um, you know, we don't have a lobby shop in Washington D.C. We have several individuals who are there that are doing what they can. But when you consider we're up against the telecom industry who spend roughly $128,000 every day to have a presence on Capitol Hill in Washington, D.C. That is that's, incredible. That's drive, that is what is driving this, this, these decisions. That's why the legislation that was introduced by the Vermont delegation, in uh, the congressional delegation for, from Vermont in the early 
1990s and again uh, just last year by a, an outgoing member of Congress. Those bills never even made it into a hearing. They were stuck. They were stuck in the committee, and then they died at the end of the term. Uh, there is no interest in airing this issue and bringing up, bringing in people like uh, Dr. Al Manville from Fish and Wildlife in the Boston region, who studies the birds and the fish and so forth and the trees. There's no interest in finding more out about this. We need to have hearings, and even though we're entering a new era politically in January. I think this is an issue all people should be concerned about. Oh, absolutely, yeah. This is definitely where right meets left. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're talking about the survival of the planet. Yeah, it's humanity. It's, it's, it's the rest of our futures. I was going to say, Dr. Uh, Howard, uh, Dr. Becker, first name. Mm -hmm. Excuse me, I'm blocking on his first name. It's terrible. But Dr. Becker was a pioneering electro, bioelectromagnetic specialist looking at uh, how animals... Uh, could regrow limbs, and he was a scientist, and he somehow came across electromagnetic fields in the 1960s and realized that uh, that he could trigger changes biologically in animals in his research, and therefore that this uh, low-level exposure from uh, power lines initially uh, is uh, possibly hazardous if it's the wrong dose. Mm -hmm. So there are very good healing applications, as you know, but... There, if the dose is, is too much for the individual or the organism, they can be harmed. He was interviewed in 1990 by um, a, a radio journalist that I know, and uh, when asked about uh, where this whole issue is going with uh, electromagnetic fields and the proliferation of applications, he said that he felt that this issue was even more important than global climate change. He used the term warming, but I think we have a new term now. It's even more important and, and holds uh, more for the future of the planet if we don't address it. And I was rather taken aback because even in 1990, you know, there was so much going on about global climate change. But when you consider that the whole process of producing electricity to supply the wireless technologies that we're living with may involve fossil fuels. That could also be a factor. It's not only the radiation itself. It's where it all comes from. And our bills are going up, and they blame that on the customer or the person. Well, it is because they have their phones on all the time, but how is that being powered by electricity? And what kind of electricity are we talking about? Well, in Arizona, a lot of it is still coal. Yeah, there's actually uh, been studies done on that, and they say that, that uh, one smartphone it, uh, represents the equivalent of running a refrigerator 24-7 as wow. far as energy consumption. That's huge. That's crazy. Yeah. One that's, smartphone. That's the most powerful appliance in the, uh, in the house. Yeah. 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 And everybody has a smartphone. Well, they say 6 billion people are using cell phones now on the whole planet. So there you go. No. Can we skip on to, uh, I was going to talk with you about the uh, strategies being used by the White House to um, get more, more people who are disabled to use wireless assistive devices. That would mean smartphones and, and other communicating applications uh, yeah. to, to provide them with more access and accommodation. They've had a campaign on this for the last two years, that I, three years that I know of. The White House Office on Disability has held conference calls, and through the National Council on Disability, who funds um, a disability uh, program in every state in the country, they have set up a campaign to, um, which they call a civil rights movement, uh, to provide all dis disabled people access and accommodation, especially in rural areas. This is really a subterfuge effort to bring wireless broadband into rural areas in the name of helping disabled people. Here in Arizona, I went twice and testified before the Arizona Center for Disability Law about this that while it's a good thing to try to give people access and accommodation, doing it using wireless technologies is going to be harmful to other people. And many people retreat to rural areas. They certainly do in Arizona. They come here for the dry air. There's no mold here, and, and they can feel better. Uh, if they have lung problems, they can get away from a lot of the uh, petrol and uh, other things that make, that make gasoline and sources and so forth because of the nature of what Arizona does here. The only thing we have a problem with is dust. But it's been a 
a good place for people to move here. But now with this campaign, uh, it is going to make it impossible for them to continue to find safety in remote areas in Arizona. And this is not only because of wireless broadband, but because all of the rural electrical cooperatives in Arizona got a waiver in 2011 from the Arizona Corporation Commission. That is our public utility commission for the state. They gave them a waiver, and they do not offer any opt-outs for smart meters. So they, they are installed, whether they're AMI or AMR meters, they are both communicating meters, and they both can cause harm. And they're misrepresenting the AMR meter, as a matter of fact, because they claim it only transmits a few seconds or minutes a day when it's actually transmitting all the time in microbursts that they are not measuring. And this is a huge factor, Libby. Uh, just real quick, I want to let our listeners know, right here in Ohio, uh, your gas meter and your water meter is right now currently an AMR meter. It's been that way for, I think, at least uh, five or seven years I've got two on my house, and they give me headaches. I mean, it is just a big problem for me. Um, so they do lie. I've been through this issue with the utility company. I've spoken with the representatives, and they will flat out tell you that they only emit once or twice a day, short little bursts, and all you need to do is buy your own RF detection meter, and you can put it up next to the thing and see it's constantly emitting. Um, and then next to come, are, of course, are the, uh, the electronic smart meters, which are way more powerful because they're operating off a, a larger power source, the, you know, your power grid, whereas the AMRs, they, they use lithium batteries. But it, those AMR meters are a big problem, and they do emit all the time. And that low-level radiation... Uh, as thousands of studies prove, is extremely hazardous. It, in fact, the low-level radiation is the most dangerous out of all the the, uh, the spectrum. So I'm glad you brought that point up. Thank you, Libby. Yeah, this is a big deal because when I get calls from help for help from people that live in a rural part of our state and I ask them who their utility provider is for electricity, uh, and we're still in... The gas meters and the water meters are not thoroughly built out in our state yet, but when they call and say they're having problems and they need help getting an opt-out, I have to give them the bad news. And people are literally having to find somewhere else to move. They're looking, even if they own their property, they can't remain in their own home. Yeah. Yeah. And it's a, this is not right to put people on the run like that. And Unfortunately, for business reasons, the White House Office of Disability and the National Council on Disabilities is supporting this new civil rights campaign and ignoring the rights of people with environmental illness. And this has been pointed out to them repeatedly on conference calls and in letters, and we are being ignored. A lot of your disabled people are older people and they're seniors already with so many health situations and, and they're already ill and frail and weak and now they're going to be bombarded with this and there's no way they're going to survive. So that's the group of people that should be protected even more. So, you know, where's the, the Americans with Disabilities Act to come in and say, hey, look what you're doing to our, our disabled people? Well, that's right, but, you know, in order to get qualified for disability, you have to prove it, and they seem more receptive to evaluating persons who have environmental health problems, which in general are invisible, right? So people are really thoroughly vetted before they get on disability when they have uh, an environmental health problem. But the, at the same time, the, the people that are implementing the Americans for Disabilities Act right out of the White House are promoting something that is toxic. Right. Mm -hmm. And we are not looking, we're not evaluating that in any organized way that I know of. And so you're right. We're going to have, someday we may look back and, and get the numbers, but we may be losing a great number of people who either can't tolerate this or just go ahead and, I'm sorry to say, it's not a happy thought, but the people, some people are killing themselves. Mm -hmm. Yes. A matter of, I know that the people are dropping like flies in this country and it's not being reported there's no epidemiology studies being done, and the data is not being collected in the hospitals. Um, I, as far as this, this human rights and civil rights issue goes, I think the United States is going to have to look to Europe and what's happening there, because right now, uh, as we speak, they're, they're, they are evaluating uh, human rights information when it comes to electromagnetic radiation and uh, EHS uh, people. 
that have you know electromagnetic hypersensitivity and the, the, the EESC I think it's, I, I'm not, I'm pretty sure it's the EESC I have to look this up and Pat and I are going to do a show on this in more depth very soon I think it's oh, the Euro great. European Economic Social Committee they're going to vote January 7th um, on whether to recognize EHS as a human rights violation in Europe. They already had a big meeting on this, and Professor Ali Johansson was there. He made a very articulated speech on it, and uh, a wonderful report was compiled on, on the violation of, of, of human rights um, because of EHS and, and EMR uh, radiation. So uh, that report, Pat and I are going to make available on our website, and we're going to look more into this uh, committee meeting in Europe. And just the fact that they even had this meeting is a victory and, and something we can look at here in the U.S. And, and, and make our public officials aware that they had this meeting. I mean, just like that, the letter from the Department of the Interior, just to point to that letter and say, hey, look, this is a federal level recognition that the radiation is harmful well now you can point to this meeting in europe and say look at this meeting they had and they are talking about all of the huge amounts of people that are going to be excluded from society because they can't stand to be exposed to this environmental hazard this man-made radiation that now is everywhere and can't be escaped so I think the U.S. will will have to uh, to recognize what's happening in Europe, don't you think, Libby? Absolutely, and that was very well put on your part, Sebastian. Yes, I mean continually, Europe has taken the lead in research and in resolutions. Uh, the European Parliament funded a study, but often these uh, plans fall in, into the hands of the people that are trying to dismiss the science. I mean, the revisionist thinking that's going on right now about the World Health Organization classification of uh, electricity and wireless as possibly carcinogenic is, is really amazing that they would turn their back on their own uh, classification. Uh, so the human rights angle, I think, is important. And Canada, you know, has a human rights statement on, on behalf of people who are electrically sensitive as well. Oh. So, um, yes, this is only going to grow. And, you know, our country... Uh, we've been active on this, those of us who've been active on a long time, maybe. We have now seen a tremendous growth in the number of people who are becoming active on this issue. And that's because of the smart meters. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Because they're just not getting the answers they need, and they're sitting in meetings with their public utilities commission and being told that there's nothing to it when they know there's something to it, and that has raised their concerns and questions about the role of government in all of this, and uh, and why aren't they getting the protection they deserve? Let, let me give you an example from my own state. We had a hearing on December 12th, and uh, we all went to Phoenix. Those of us who, get, who could get there, a lot of people are unable to go because they can't be in those wireless environments. Yeah. And uh, over 35 people testified. We flew in Dr. Martin Blank from Canada, who wrote the book Overpowered, Good. What, what Science Tells Us About the Dangers of Cell Phones and Other Wi-Fi Age Devices. Great book. Go get it, people. Overpowered, Dr. Martin Blank. That is a great book. It's Seven Stories Press. You can get it on Amazon, Dr. Martin Blank. Yeah. And uh, he came and testified, d discussed fundamentally what is going on with the cells in our body, the cells in our body, and how those... Cells are activated by uh, external forces like electromagnetic fields and how those cells are altered by that exposure. And it's so fundamental. It was a fascinating discussion. Unfortunately, I'm not sure everybody could understand him because they are not educated enough in the science. So they respected him and they asked questions, but they didn't all understand him. And then, in fact, they tried to coerce him in saying some things that he refused to say, like that he he himself used Wi-Fi, but he didn't want any smart meters. They tried to catch him up in that, but he's much too good for that. He, yes. <laughs> so uh, they presented a report the state health department had done. We had received the report in, in advance, so we could speak to that report. This report was an embarrassment for the state health department in Arizona. They did a literature review that was clearly biased in favor of those who dismissed there's any uh, problem. And it mirrored the other reports that have come out prior to ours in 
Maine, Vermont, Texas, and California. So it's as though they got together behind the scenes and decided how to portray things in Arizona to be consistent. And they also used a meter called 10 Mars, which is not uh, at appropriate for measuring smart meters. And the, the methodology they used to test the smart meters was wrong as well. We had expert letters and people there to testify to this, that they used the wrong meter. Nevertheless, the Arizona Corporation Commission passed an opt-out policy, and they said um, APS, that's the largest utility in the state, American Power Supplies, AMI meters are safe. We're challenging that. And they also, by the way, there's something else I learned in the process. APS is going to require anyone who has solar panels on their house to have an AMI meter on their house. Oh, my God. Oh, they're, my they're coming in after the fact on this. When people got their solar panels, who knew when they went up, right? Whoa. Now they have to have one or maybe two AMI meters. Oh, my God. One for the company, the solar company, and the other one for the utility. And this is being challenged. Yeah. Yeah, and you know, they happen in other states. These these uh, digital meters, whether they're AMR or a smart meter, really the, the the end game goal of having these meters is is control. Of course, it's data collection too. But when when you have entire uh, grids of these uh, digital meters with uh, two way communication or even one way communication, they they literally can just control the power that that you consume. With, uh, remotely, so I, I think that's why they're doing that. It, it's basically just in the future, uh, if something, let's say, the dollar collapses or whatever, you know, I, I mean, they they can literally control how much power uh, or gas or water everyone uses. It's the ultimate form of control. Right. If put a play be in place in the context of providing for a reliable power supply and to back each other up. Uh, na na nationwide, anyway, under the na net looking at it nationally, in the event of a, uh, a blackout or a brownout. You know, I think I told you my dad uh, was the co -found first, uh, uh, first director and co-founder of the um, North American um, uh, Electrical Reliability Corporation, which is based near Princeton in New Jersey and now is a regulatory agency for the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. And its job is to um, assure the reliability of the American power supply, bringing together all the public and private utilities in the country. This has been going on since the 1970s. It's a big national grid with links into Canada and Mexico, and it works. Now we have a wireless overlay for this, and the utilities are basically not involved in running it. A third party does. Mm. The third party collects the data on everybody and their and their habits and their... They haven't even fully implemented it yet, you know, uh, the whole grid idea. And nobody really knows who runs what and who controls what and who over who's the oversight for the whole process. It's it's just all like a, a big mystery out there, and and there is no one to call to find out, is there, Libby? No, there isn't. Uh, uh, we're just talking about the U.S. right now, which is supposed to hook up internationally through interoperability guidelines. But we had a our our corporation commission had a privacy proposal, a privacy rule they were proposing for all of their regulated utilities, and they kept sending it out for comments, and only one person commented at the hearing on December 12th, and that was to say, we don't think this policy is even uh, necessary, because we know you don't have control over wireless-enabled data. It can so easily be hacked into and where this data goes, we don't ha we don't know. And the man who testified ended up saying it's like putting lipstick on a pig. Whoa! Yeah, good luck. Well, it just was kind of insulting, and I can understand why he said that. Because why would we approve something that was designed not to work from the start? Libby, did you have a good turnout from the folks from Sedona? Because I know they've been extremely active in this uh, the smart meter rollout. Yes, I, I did. did. I know you? the people in Sedona, mm -hmm. even though we're three hours apart. Right, right. And they came down en masse, and uh, one of their city councilmen came down and testified on behalf of the citizen, and their city attorney came down and uh, worked out a deal. Oh, APS uh, wanted uh, every customer that had an analog meter to indemnify themselves, take out an insurance policy, and we challenged that. We said, why would that be necessary? Why would they want to indemnify? You have the analog owners indemnify themselves, 
and not the smart meter owners. Uh, what is that to protect the utility against? And it was not clear, clearly understood, but the Sedona attorney did what he could to protect the people. Uh, it was good that he was there because this was moving, this hearing moved pretty fast. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah, I was interested. I've been reading a lot about the folks in Sedona. I figured they'd be a good group to, to have been represented there. Yeah, they, they actually have a, a statement by the city council opposing smart meters. But, you know, you, and many uh, local areas have done this. Marin County, California, where I used to live, has had a ban on them for almost three years now. But the thing is, they can't enforce it because if you're a utility customer, the equipment is yours, uh, theirs, and the service is theirs, and you have give your implied consent when you sign up for the service. So how can a local government ban it? Mm. Well, the little town of Fairfax in, in Virginia and yeah. happened to have a clause in their city charter that prevent that all that also uh, pr permits them to prohibit smart meters and cell towers. Ooh, that's but great. But just a little wrinkle in their law, but. Um, all of this has to be monitored and enforced, and it's a constant battle, along with everything else we're dealing with in, in our lives today. Uh, this, has, this issue has more layers than an onion. Absolutely. But, you know, with, with the WHO, um, I was so happy to see that, that 1973 Warsaw-Poland document uh, come out. It was finally declassified, and Professor Ali Johansson has talked about it. Barry Trower has talked about it. Uh, and, and a couple other top scientists have, have really uh, pointed to this document. If you want to look at a WHO document, look to that 1973 Warsaw document, and, and it's titled, uh, I'm, I'm paraphrasing here, but it's basically it, it, it's about the hazardous biological health effects from uh, electromagnetic radiation and microwave uh, RF radiation. And they spell out, there's pages and pages and pages of all the health hazards from 1973, they knew it all, and they classified it top secret so it could be kept from the public. Well, true. Uh, if you go to Magda Havis's website, magdahavis.com, she has a, a little section called Zori's List. Yes. Zori Glazer was a, an employee of the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, and he's now retired. And he gave her a very large uh, amount of research that was not classified, but very telling. For example, there was a report put out by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Health, Education, and Welfare, which is what it called at that time, in 1979, mm -hmm. listing all of the effects and calling for more protection. It isn't though as though the research is not there; they just dismiss it. Yeah, they want it. They they went and proved it was unhealthy and harmful, and then they just pretend like it never happened and they ignore their own research. And since, and since 1965, the standards set by the IEEE and the uh, uh, National Institute of Radiation Protection uh, and other organizations that have, and ANSI that have looked at uh, exposure standards and set guidelines, um, they've rather they have set standards. The federal government has set guidelines, which is different. It's legally different. Um, they uh, always based uh, the exposure standards on avoiding heat. Even though the science, particularly in Eastern Europe, goes back seven decades showing that low-intensity uh, fields can affect biology. Yeah, Russia started their research in 1920. Yes, the first uh, study on radio frequency radiation showing a bio-effect was in 1929. It was called the Pearly Chain Effect. Yeah, yeah, and and by, you know by the end of World War II, I mean so much was known just from uh, radar exposure that they knew all about radio wave sickness. Um, and Barry Trower cited eight thousand three hundred known military studies citing hazardous biological effects, and I believe he handed uh, uh, Dr. Magda Havas personally about four thousand of them, and and she has not released all of them yet, but. That was great that you pointed out uh, her website and uh, Zori Glazer's archives because I, a lot of that material is there, and th that's thanks to Barry Trower. It is. Uh, in part, it's thanks to Barry and th to, uh, to Ms. Dr. Uh, Zori Glazer, and probably the reason why it's not on all on her website is that it is very expensive to um, have the right equipment to scan all this stuff in, the yeah. manpower to scan all this stuff in and to post it. 
Yeah. It takes money and it takes time. So if anybody wants to support getting more of that information out, go to go to Magda's, uh, Dr. Havis's website and ask what you can do to help because there is a lot of data that isn't yet on the web that should be. As long as we have a free and open Internet, and I hope we always do, we should have that information online. Absolutely. And clearly when people say we need more research, we need more research, that's just not the answer. The research is there. We don't need any more research. It's there. No, and we don't have time. Exactly. We're running out of time. We're being radiated in our own homes by smart meters. Our children are being radiated, and they don't even know the ramifications. The people putting it on, they don't even know what the long-term effects are going to be from short-term exposure. So time is of the essence there, there is no time and it's pointless to to call for more exactly. research it, when you're talking about 8300 military studies since the 1920s yes. and they all say the same thing well it's just a stall tactic it's obviously stall tactic. this is a very complicated issue and uh, uh because there's a federal law that that does not permit cities to take health into concern mm -hmm. into account when talking about cell towers. Yeah. It seems as though that philosophy is now spread to include other sources of radiation. Mm -hmm. And it, it's like people are not curious. Uh, and if they are, they're quickly overwhelmed by all this information. So it's hard to break it down in a way that uh, get people to think about their own behavior and, and see the urgent need to advocate uh, oppose all of this wireless infrastructure as soon as possible. The, the sense of urgency that the three of us feel, unfortunately, is not shared. Yep. I hear from people when they're up against an emergency, like a, right now a proposed cell tower at a school in my town. I'm helping with that. Um, but on the other hand, some communities are offered money by telecom, and even though I warn them, you're being co-opted. You need to really evaluate this proposal. They take the money because they need it. And that's heartbreaking for me. Well, it, it's, it's been a, a brilliant campaign by the telecom industry and the government to get people uh, hooked, dependent, and addicted on wireless technology. Everybody loves their smartphones. They love the, the wireless connectivity. Um, and they've been given something that should not have been given to them in the first place. And they don't understand how that technology's changed over the last five, ten years. And and that's by design. The warnings are in the packaging. The information is not available. When they switched from 1G, 2G, 3G, 4G, 5G, that is information that everybody should be aware of on, on the possible health ram ramifications to them and their children, and no one has any idea. And they just think that's the same cell phone they've had for 10 years. Yeah, good point, because the signal characteristics are different. What frequencies in addition to the carrier frequency are present in that signal. Yeah. What amplitude and modulation? This will affect the penetration of the cells. Yeah. Um, what power levels are at work? And when you combine this every day with the other exposure conditions people are getting used to in their lives, when they put their cell phone under their pillow or they leave it in, on their person all day long, touching their body and they're sitting in Wi-Fi and near cell towers and near other people, subjecting themselves to secondhand radiation. There is an effect, and all of these different signals each have their own characteristics. Mm -hmm. And everybody reacts right. differently. Right. But yeah. everyone does react. Everyone reacts. And yeah. they don't necessarily know how to attribute it. Exactly. I wanted to make a recommendation, if I can, because I really do want to break this down in such a way for your listeners so that they can find out the information that they need. And one way to do it is through taking a look at Katie Singer's book, An Electronic Silent Spring. Um, I've just been asked to be on a panel with Katie uh, in the next week or so to talk about what, what kind of work I'm doing and what's coming, pretty much what we've been talking about here. But in this book, I wrote two sections having to do with how people can oppose a, a smart meter and how people can oppose a cell tower from, from the bottom up, like what material they should get from the city, uh, what questions they should ask, how they should organize themselves, and, and they should, in fact, take the time to get an educational section, session with somebody, whether it's through showing a movie, like uh, the one on, what's the name of that, Res Residence or Take Back Your Power, or the one that I made, Public Exposure, DNA Democracy and the Wireless Revolution, which is available on YouTube. Um, spend a little time educating your neighbors so people get an overview of what this is all about. 
And if it's about, if they're concerned about their health, this is something they would want to spend time on. But they do need to think about the health aspects. Absolutely. And we interviewed Katie Singer, and folks can hear that interview at boilthefrogradio.com. Get her book, Electronic Silent Spring, and read those two uh, sections that you wrote to really give the folks an idea of what they can do and not just talk about it and be worried about it. I agree. That was a great, great piece of advice. We're going to begin to wrap up a bit, Libby. So if, if folks want to find out more, you gave those suggestions. Is there any way that they can contact you, anything like that, that you want yes, to share? Yes, of course. Let me give you my email address. Okay. It's L-K-E-L-L-E-Y underscore 45 at msn.com. Excellent, excellent. Yeah, and, and please, pe- people, uh, contact Libby. I mean, she's making herself available to you, and she is just a, a wealth of knowledge and experience on this issue. Well, thank you once again. Yeah, thank you so much, Libby. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Well, thank you for joining us on Boil the Frog Slowly Radio. Please come back next week, and for more information, go to the website, boilthefrogradio.com. And until next week, remember to practice safe phone. Boil the frog slowly, you're a frog in a pot. Turn up the heat and things will get hot. Will you jump out or will you burn? Listen to the show and you will return to Boil the Frog Slow.